Okay, what we're going to do now is disappear and explore some other parts of Morocco. So rather than just concentrating on the Paris-Dakar stages, we're going to just see the lot of scenic highlights and ride in roads within Morocco and end up Marrakesh. So this is sort of part two of the video and we're set off out of the dunes and then we're going to hit some other trails heading, heading I don't know where. We're also going to follow Zippy and see where he takes us. A little bit more dust around today. I'm not complaining, it's what you'd expect out here. Bye bye dunes. Very different sort of Morocco coming up. Where are we going? It's like a vast lake of nothingness. It's only this Kajiva on the pegs doesn't feel quite as natural as the Africa twin. You wanna you wanna raise the bars. <laughs> Just a bit too tall. That's James. <laughs> and his Dakar impression. I'll catch Charlie up. Dodge the stones. Absolutely made for it, that one. Catch the leaders up. This is more like Dakar as I remember with the dust. And you just gotta keep your distance, otherwise you pick a stone up just when you don't want one. I'm gonna hang back again. What a mega place this is. Big old wall, old town. What do I do? Do I give away to mules? Where are we? Oh, we went through here in the Testarossa. We have a picture of me going through here, and here we are yet again. This time on the Kajiva. Amazing how the scenery suddenly starts to change. I think we're climbing up, we're heading sort of um, west, so we're heading towards Atlas Mountain, still a long way off. But already this sort of changes, there's more elevation, there's this rock sort of appear and there's sand being blown across. I think this is a very famous desert area, I reckon this is what everybody's trying to, sorry, fossil area, this is a fossil area everybody's trying to collect their own fossils. struck me in the Ferrari as well is just the vastness of Morocco. Huge distances you're covering between regions. This giant landscape, you can see why it's used for making, they make a lot of films out here. A lot of the westerns they used to build, uh, film out here. A lot of Bond movie film. In fact, well, I think we're off to a, you see a volcano that was used in a Bond movie. We got it here then. There's some mules, I think. Yeah, he's given up on the idea of crossing the road with the little baby ones. Oh, no, thinking about it. Survive on a diet of mainly rock. Wow, we. Over there, we're going to ride up to Hughes Inspector. God, why would he bike out here? I presume it's a local. Wow, we. So 
Sorry? Right. There's a, quite a climb inside, I'm not sure. Bloody hell, this bike's good. Don't want to go in there. Don't want to go in there. I've gone in there. I've got away with it. I don't know about that. Okay, well, wow. Yeah. You just got to keep going, keep them in. I got into the loose a bit, but we got out of it. God, that's a sight. Wow. That was quite an ambitious route up. <laughs> yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. That ain't gonna happen. Right there. I'm not sure where you're going. I certainly stop there. Let's gather our thoughts. I don't think you'll go up there. I think we want to get on this piece here. damage to the road. It's amazing, they didn't warn about it. Look at the length of this road, you can see it disappearing into the distance. Just catch up with Zippy. Look at that vastness. God, imagine the rain to do this. Tumbling across here. Super slippery those. Um, I can have a moments on those with a bike, but it's all right in the car. We just splash through. But on a bike, they can be so slippery. It's untrue. Now where do you go? Where do we think? Uh, was police? So we're turning left. There's lots of police. Is he waving us on? 
Smiling policeman waving us on. I like that. Look at that, that's the Atlas Mountains looming. Last time I was here there was snow on top, but I can't see any. But uh, higher than you realise. Well, they're over 3,000 metres. And there is, allegedly, ski resorts in uh, Morocco, which I didn't realise. There's also a bloke with his camels. Well, morning. We're on day two of this trip through the inner bits of Morocco. Yesterday we left the dunes, headed through some sort of real desert areas, visited that uh, volcano. There isn't a volcano, but it was used in the Spectre film. And last night stayed in Tener, market town, bustling sort of place, um, which was a great place to stay actually. And today's mission is we're heading up into the Atlas Mountains proper, to stop for a coffee stop uh, now. Just the vast distances again always get me when Morocco and the crazy sights you see, the camels wandering across the road and sheep. And in these towns, people don't really uh, mind which side of the road you go up and down. And then the water everywhere uh, because of this recent rain and then suddenly the road turns to gravel. So yeah, usual madness that you come to expect in Morocco. But I think before we head up into the hills, I ought to just show you around the bikes and just show you some of the difference of them. So I'm just gonna grab the camera. Here we go. Starting off with this one, my son's Charlie's bike, the um, RDO3 Honda Africa Twin. Um, this, as I say, this is a 1988 bike, this one. What I love about this one is it's, it's a proper Dakar bike, fully protected. You see how all the sump guards, all the guards up there, it really was thought out. And even protection around the disc, it's, you can't quite see from here, but it all flared in. We're very jealous of this bike because Charlie actually has the um, yellow headlights and this is a competition windscreen here. Um, that's why it should be clear on most of them, but this one is so you can put your number on it. And it's done a few events, this thing. Charges on. This is about, um, I think it was a 1500 bike when I bought it, 1500 pounds. Very clever, 650cc, twin plug head, three valve, twin plug so it's reliable. Um, you can, you know, one, one plug to go down, you've still got another plug that will um, keep going if you're in, stuck in the desert or whatever. And also called, um, very enclosed, it's a bit of a bitch to work on. But, on the other flip side, it has this one foot tank and here is very narrow. So, when you're standing on it, you're standing on the pegs, it's really nice uh, to use off-road on the pegs, this bike. It's all very thought out and tough as they come. Um, Pro-link suspension, that was off the motocrossers of the period, um, so that was a nice turn, gave it a lot of suspension travel, tucked in exhaust, we put the crash bars on etc, they've been exercised a few times, yeah it's looking a bit beaten up but that's the way Charlie likes it. Right, then I'm on this Kajiva 900 IE, now this was the bike that won uh, Dakar in 1990 and 94, and this has all the trick bits, I feel very privileged to have found this, they're super rare in the UK, highly prized in Europe. I don't know how many there are in the UK, but just a handful. Because this is in effectively the just like the competition bike itself. It's a little company, Kajiva. So what makes the 900IE special is that injected engine, big valve head, and tell that by these gold um, covers over the valves, uh, overhead cam obviously on this thing, but air cooled. And what I really like about this bike is it's super light, powerful, um, and this plastic tank, you can see the alloy uh, frame coming around here. This is 188 kilos dry, as against the Honda, which I think is 203, 204 kilos dry. 57 horsepower for the Honda, 68 horsepower for the Kajiva 900 IE and it just races up to um, its rev limit in top, it's about 200 kilometers an hour, something like that. But it, it just feels more nimble than the um, Honda Africa Twin, but I'd like, I'd like it to be a bit narrow on the tank, it's all a bit wide. Strangely has a 19 inch wheel, when you normally have a 21 inch wheel when you go off road because it goes over bumps easier, but very nimble because of its lightweight. And then finally we have this, the Super Tenery Yamaha, 750. 
trick engine on this. This is its star turn as its trick engine. Dry sumped, um, five valve per cylinder, uh, twin cylinder uh, engine, and 69 horsepower. So supposedly the most powerful of the bunch, but that's all they really spent money on. So you'll see it has steel rims. It does actually have twin um, discs up front, but then it's the heaviest bike here by quite a margin. It's 216 kilos, as you see it here. Um, so it needs that extra horsepower and the Kajiva's easily got the legs of it. Kajiva's quite a lot quicker than the other two bikes actually actually on the road. Very comfy this bike, it's got the best seat um, and they were very popular in their day. That's a little look round the bikes. And now we're head up into the hills, up into the mountains, a bit chilly, a completely different scenery than we've got down here in this sort of inner town. Good old Morocco, suddenly the road runs out. Yeah, I wouldn't want to go over the edge, would you? If you'd bring a Ferrari out here, you'd be mad to do that. Free roaming goats up ahead, yeah. Doing. They cross the road, Shepherds on one side of the road, there they all are. You stay there guys. They're sheep aren't they? And goats, a bit of a mix. There's a nice howl from this uh, Kajima, the Ducati engine. It loves revs and there's just an induction bar, you can hear it. up to the, uh, well, about eight and a half thousand, nine thousand revs in top gear. Uh, it's about 200 kilometers an hour, it's not, not really, it's got a sort of competition gearbox, that's all the speed you needed if you were going to do Dakar. One of these amazing beaten up Mercedes taxis up ahead. Millions of kilometers. Well, I don't know if they do that many, but they've certainly got hundreds of thousands on the clock. That one looks a pretty good nick. They do seem amazingly friendly, actually, in Morocco. Even the sort of fossil sellers, they tell great stories, etc. Um, yeah, there we are. Lord knows where we are. where they don't bother with a bridge, they just give you a four to go across, but it's quite a lot of water, but a lot more water was here a couple of days ago, so that's why we sort of delayed coming through here. <clears throat> Incredibly scenic though. Just having the Atlas Mountains as this backdrop. 
going through water that's actually rushing past you. What a spectacular scenery we're going through at the moment. Just went through a series of sort of sweeping bends. It's just getting more and more dramatic as we head up. Oh, they all want this. Even the little girl wants us to rev them. Lord knows where we are. I've gone through so many water um, passes. The last one into this village had a, like an eight inch step at the end of it, it was a proper off-road course. Wouldn't like to do it in a car, but they must get about, they must be able to do it. We're climbing, I don't know how high we are now, probably about 1,800, 2,000 metres. Six, seven thousand feet. It's just after one o'clock, so I guess all the schools are broken up or something because it's all the kids out now. There they go. <laughs> they want us to put a wheelie. No, it's not going to happen. Look at them. You have no idea what's round the next corner. I think how far that water's dropped, and it's must have been up here fairly recently. Danger sign. Oh, that was there. No, it's got swept away underneath. So the road looks all right, but underneath has been washed away. Yikes! Yamaha Super Tenery has just gone on to reserve. Not sure if this town looks like one will have a petrol station, but it would be very useful. Sometimes in Morocco you can buy fuel sort of in old sort of water bottles uh, at local stores. can't get over how you're in the middle of nowhere. We're, it's getting quite cool now, I don't know what we are, 2,000 plus metres. There's snow now appearing on top of the mountains there. Uh, he's hopeful, it sounds there's lots of nodding. Lots of nodding, so there must be fuel down here. Well he's hoping. Well, we're now being led by a bloke in a dressing gown in a, on a moped to where you can buy fuel around these parts. We pointed to the petrol can on a uh, petrol tank on the on the bike. He says, "Oh, this way, this way." There he is up the front. Wow, we're in the centre of town. Here we are, 
sans plomb. There's a fuel stop. <laughs> As I say, this isn't your regular fuel stop, but this is how it works out here. Yep, that's the local garage. How much? Five litres or Five litres? Nish has had it Five Right, this is how you buy fuel. Look at that. How much are you buying? How do we check how much that is? <laughs> What's on the on the water? Has it got anything on it? On the on the teapot? <laughs> oh I see, so he's five litres with the other bottle. So that's four litres in the watering can. And that's a litre. So that's your five litres. Right. Okay. <laughs> oh, we've got another kettle coming. <laughs> tea. <laughs> tea. 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 Oh, so, this. This. Oh, he's doing that. Oh, that is a teapot. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, well. <laughs> and here comes another five, five litres. There's our, there's our man, <laughs> guide us in. Snow background. That is fantastic. Snow in the background. There's a man who rescued us. <laughs> I don't know, it won't be much. Thank you. No, it doesn't really. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. No problem. No problem. A, a cafe here. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Au revoir. Funny enough, I've always, every time we travel in Morocco, it looks a bit scary. They've always been a huge help whenever we have to ask for help for locals. And here he is, there he is, 10 litres. What do we think? <laughs> it's closing in now. Those with waterproofs have put their waterproofs on. Those that haven't got waterproofs, like me, I've got a waterproof jacket on, but uh, legs are Dakar trousers, because I was going to the Sahara Desert of Morocco, didn't need waterproofs. Well, this is like riding in Scotland. Um, a very cold, biting wind, chucking it down with rain. November the 16th is today's date. This is what Morocco is like up in the Atlas Mountains. It can take you by surprise. And we've done the lower pass because we knew there was snow on top. They did a recce a few days ago and uh, there was snow. So we've done the lower pass. But yeah, Morocco is full of surprises. And just to think, yesterday I was charging this bike around in a brilliant warm sunshine around on the dunes. That's not very far away from where we are now. Oh. I'm glad when we get to the hotel now. Rain stop, but I'm chuffing frozen now. Going dropping down this through this gorge. Every now and then there's mud all over the road and a lorry inching its way up the hill. Not very friendly uh, conditions for motorbiking. But it's all part of the f of the fun. Oh, so cold. It's half six. Just gone for a, another rainstorm. Just trying to find a hotel now. But oh, it's a reminder of what biking in the winter can be like. Not my favourite thing. Oh, a little bit of roughness to get up to the hotel by the look of things.
going? Oh. Oh, a welcome sight. Okay, well morning. This is the final day of this trip across uh, the inner part of uh, Morocco up over the Atlas Mountains. Yesterday went right up into the hills, uh, beautiful scenery and uh, crossing this constant water up there, crossing uh, rivers etc as you follow the road up and up into the Atlas Mountains. Um, um, and then came through the gorge, weather closed in again, um, and we were, it was like old biking in the winter. It was down about seven, eight degrees, chucking it down, hiding behind the fairing, sort of like old sort of moped days, trying to keep warm. And eventually arrived at this beautiful hotel. Um, we're in Bourman uh, Dardis when we're off to uh, Marrakesh today, but just about 200 meters from the hotel, the Amaha stopped again. And uh, that's why it's all, if you don't want to come over, <coughs> it's all stripped down. And we looked everywhere in the dark trying to find a fuse box because it's just stopped dead. There was no electrics to do anything, no lights, no start and nothing. And we eventually found there's a fuse, just a single little fuse, which is this inline fuse, I don't know if you can see it, um, and that had decided just to self-destruct and come, come off. And that was a dead bike, so that's why it stripped down. So we've, we've rewired it again this morning. There is also a little pool of fuel underneath. This has a fuel issue by the look of things. It's using chunks of fuel and also dripping out of a tap. So not particularly healthy. The rest of the bikes just storm on, uh, having an uh, amazing ride over the hills. Different today, it's gonna to be mainly on road. So I'm gonna to swap to the new Africa Twin and put the Kajiva on the van um, because I think it's, it's done wonderfully well, but it does actually need a new battery. So every time we have to start it, we generally have to uh, bump start it. Um, what I didn't explain yesterday was just the values of the bikes. And as I said, the Africa Twin was like a 1500 pound bike. and We've had such fun on it. The Kajiva is very different on value. It's 7,000 pound bike, what I, I paid for it the other day, but it's super rare. And I love the history behind it. And it's, and it really performed and it is the lightest bike here. The cheapest bike of all is the Yamaha. These are everywhere and these are only, I think I paid 1200 or 1400 pounds for this bike. And it's, and it's really coat well. This is a minor fix. We don't mind fixes like this and the fuel I think is just a float um, valve or something like that. So there you go, they're the bikes. Today, very different ride into Marrakesh where it's warmer. It was five degrees here this morning. I'm, t I'm promised 21 degrees in Marrakesh, which I'm quite looking forward to. See you later. I do like a good cast bar and it's got a wonderful position up on the top, gravel road approach and off we go. It's funny being on the new Africa Twin again after the Kajiva, after the two days on the Kajiva. Better riding position up on the pegs weirdly on the Africa Twin bars are slightly higher just make a bit more sense and just yeah it ticks over and so it's easy to ride I, I love it being not a DCT actually I think I'm a bit of an old fart on that one but uh, yeah just having the clutch control the clutch is crucial when you're off-road you use it a huge amount um, people worry they're gonna wear out or you know they're going to cook it but they're oil based clutches on these sort of bikes and that's what you use for traction and you just feather the clutch going up inclines and stuff like that just really helps well, there we go anyway it's mainly tarmac today just got to make our way out of here and there's a bit of tarmac off we go Total elevation yesterday 3,400 metres. Current elevation 1,600 metres. Higher than you think, isn't it? About 5,000 feet or thereabouts. Higher than Ben Nevis. Well, look at that. Renault. I was going to say a Renault 12, but I wasn't quite confident enough to say it. But yeah, Renault 12. That's where they're all hiding in Morocco. 
I've forgotten the little button on the handlebar on the New Africa Twin, and that's heated grips. So I feel a bit guilty about because the other guys, as I say, it's about eight degrees at the moment, um, and heated grips are very nice on a chilly morning like this, especially when we get going. In fact, they're just anybody who's experienced a heated steering wheel and things like that, you suddenly say, "Ooh, you know, it's one of those luxuries you didn't know you needed." Heated grips on a motorbike are very nice indeed. Charlie on his Africa Twin is inseparable of that bike. He's got about 2,000 photographs of it now, and about three of every other bike. But uh, yeah, it's a bit of a shed, but that's part of its appeal, and I love its number plate being hack because that's exactly what it is. It's the farm hack. But it's also been across the Pyrenees. Super Tenere, which hasn't really been ridden much until to the, on this trip. It's been great to have that along. It's got this rasp, it sounds like a two stroke, you hear it constantly in the, the behind you. There it goes. Yeah, really good sound. Yeah, I think we've had our money's worth out of it as well. So, um, the temperature has gone down to six degrees, so everybody is togging up. Um, my guilt complex with the heated grips is going higher. Uh, Zippy's got them on, on the KTM as well and John's wondering what the hell when he specced his Africa Twin he didn't spec heated grips. Oh, I only dried it in the summer. So yeah, two layers of gloves going on there. Charlie's got every item of clothing he's got on this holiday. He's going to borrow my winter gloves. But yeah, and look at the snow up on the Atlas Mountains. Another amazing road is down into Waziat. This is the uh, RN10. Came along here in the Testarossa as well. And this is a lot of this area is used for filming. You can sort of see why. Backdrop of the snow capped Atlas Mountains over there. Waziat now, completely different feel biggest place I suppose we've visited so far. Got fountains, flags, traffic lights, buses and God knows what, where's he going? I don't know. He's a bit optimistic in the outside lane on his bike. <laughs> Door open on the bus, doesn't seem to close. Past him. What's going on here? Suddenly decided to go off road. Ah, some of the film sets, that's what we've come down here for. Look at them. Ha! Why is the act is famous for? We. This is where all the filming's done. Well, we. Oh, yep. hey, security. Wow. <laughs> oh, I've got another one. <laughs> James is up. Don't hang about. We're inside now. It's utterly nuts. See, oh, that must be stone, big things there. And then you go, and it's all wrong. <laughs> so you can see the plaster falling off it. Huge amount of effort to build this place, though. My goodness. Yeah. More craziness in Morocco. quite finished. Right, onward over the Atlas Mountains into the snow and down to Marrakesh. 
beautiful valley coming up here, the sudden red stone and the Atlas Mountains, the snowy peaks just in over the top there. I remember bringing the Ferrari down here and loving this bit of road. We had a lot of snow up the top then. And then it just came to this side and it was drier and better tarmac. on too hard because I'm on knobbly tyres but yeah, they've got a bit of grip well, what I don't trust is spilt diesel mud and gravel all sorts of hazards oh, nice of mud. Whoa. Yeah, not a place to bring your sports bike. Street market. Oh God, imagine being those sheep all tied up. Yeah, in Morocco. Look at this. All going on. The smells. Yeah. Just amazing sort of cooked kebabs and sort of beautiful whiffs coming through as you drive through these places as street food and it's over yeah that snow's not going away yeah just getting near the top of the pass now snow's appearing oh here we go here we go oh we're selling the rocks uh, don't want any more rocks what altitude are we? 2,160 metres. There we are. 2,200 metres. And that's sort of top of the pass. I think this might be where we're stopping for lunch. Buy more rocks. Fossils. Maybe not. I don't know. 2260. Oh, I got 2218. There you go. Looks like he's pressing on. Oh, going down the other side then. Oh, I thought we were stopping up there. Right, Marrakesh, here we come. Okay, suddenly the road has sort of disintegrated. It's sort of wide but it's not tarmac and it's muddy and every now and then it is crazy slippery. Um, so it's a lovely three lane tarmac up the top, but not quite so good down here. Any of these daft pinch points. The crash barrier hanging off the hillside. Yeah, that didn't last very long. It always was a horrendous bit of road, actually. I was so disappointed when it came up in the Testarossa. Um, it'll be nice when it's finished. Well, we arrived at Marrakesh. We're outside the hotel, just about to de-kit. Um, mega trip. It's about a thousand kilometres, I think, we've done in all. Um, and it was oh, that ride down, actually, into uh, Marrakesh, the RN9. It's almost, you could describe it as the hell road. It's, it has always been bad, but I really didn't like it this time with those sort of muddy sections and those lorries spray, uh, sprinkling water on it to make it extra slippery. Everyone seemed to have a moment. You've got to do overtakes, otherwise you'll sit behind a truck for half an hour. Uh, I hope soon it'll all be improved because it gives you access to a wonderful part of Morocco. And there's so much to explore in this country. And it's so diverse and it's crazy and it's hugely enjoyable I find out here but yeah just to, if you're thinking of doing a trip like this I just want to show you around the bikes and some of the kits and how it all works out this is um, the new Africa Twins Adventure Sports I've had this since about February time I just I like the Honda Africa Twin because it's this sort of dual purpose 
uh, bike. I've ridden it quite a lot off-road. And then this is their new um, anniversary edition, so the 30 year celebration of when the RD03 came out, the original Africa Twin, which my son Charlie rocks around on, and uh, that sort of got me into these bikes. The new version, obviously, way more power, 100 horsepower, six speed gearbox, huge amount of suspension trouble, and the Adventure Sports added a bigger tank. Now, we've ridden just over 300 kilometres today, 340 kilometres and the range is saying I've still got about 140 miles left, so it's two units. Um, but that, that tank gives you a massive range, but it does actually bring the bike up. And this is a tall bike, I'm just over six foot. You look at the size of bike, and it then also weighs 245 kilos, which is a lot. And I find this off-road pretty good, actually. I mean, a lot of travel, very natural on the pegs. But when you come to stop, you, you've just got to get your feet down. And you, with a heavy bike, I find as soon as you have three degrees of lean, you're really wrestling with the weight. And then you get moving again, and then the weight sort of disappears. I did struggle a bit in sand, um, but that's sort of down to the weight and a bit my experience. Tires, TKC Continental, TKC 80s these tires are. I think they're absolutely ace, they're obviously a knobbly tire but they work pretty well on road as well because they're a soft rubber so there's more grip than you expect. Have a quick look at Charlie's bike. This is the original RDO 3, the original Africa Twin. Big tank as well, 650 twin engine on this. Um, lots of ground clearance because it's leaning the other way it doesn't look as though it's got the same amount of suspension travel but it has really easy bike to ride it's very forgiving and utterly natural also when you get on the pegs because it's a narrower tank and the whole thing is more petite and it's more manageable it's easier to boss this bike around than the modern Africa twin and it and you you just feel a bit of a hero on it because you can make it do things you would not believe Charlie was charging around the dunes on this he's never ridden in dunes and he was off and it's just adding the horsepower it's a really friendly device um, and if you want to get into this sort of adventure riding, well this is a great way to start. And then you've got the price point. Well we paid 1500 for this, you're going to pay about £2,500 for one of these now. Um, and then luggage. I want to start to show you around some of the kit. You see a lot of bikes with big panniers on and things. If you're really going off-road, I recommend soft luggage and just putting it on with bungee cords. Because there are going to be moments when the bike will you'll come off and you'll be on soft and the panniers just get in the way and then they get bashed and it just makes the, the bike even bulkier with soft luggage you haven't got any of that but the even better way is to like we've done we've been guided and there's a van taking our luggage when we arrive at the hotel and you just unpack all your luggage that's a better way of doing it then on gear first most important thing you've got to buy is a, a good helmet and you might notice a lot of my kit is clim and they have uh, it's expensive stuff, don't get given it if you're thinking that, but they make some wonderful kit and you just, you just fail safe if you buy Klim kit. This is a really lightweight ha uh, helmet, carbon fibre, I can wear it all day, no problem at all, and it's got a vented peak so it doesn't really catch the wind. And some people use goggles all the time, I find it really convenient to use these modern helmets with a visor. Uh, and then use sunglasses underneath but yeah that's personal preference I have a camera on the side um, these little prism tube quite rare in the UK uh, and it turns on and off by just putting that it gets a bit of dust in it like this one it gets a bit stiff but apart from that that's okay then coming down I've tried on this tour because we're right in the middle of nowhere in Morocco um, there's not an air ambulance on call so if you're in the middle of the desert I, start, I just try to wear this neck brace, clips around like that, and, it, and you sort of, once you put it on, I really didn't notice I, have, I had it. The only thing I've noticed is when you're turning at junctions, just slightly restricts your V, but apart from that, for the safety point of view, it's not a bad thing to have, but they're expensive. That was, I think they listed about 360 pounds, so expensive option. Then you'll need, I've got this lightweight, just a windproof, waterproof as well um, because you know like we saw on this trip we had rain um, it's got zip out sleeves um, tucks the harness into here and then because we're in the Morocco it has vents so you think they're pockets but they're actually just vents um, so you can just cool down a bit 
I spy open those. You're better off having a lightweight jacket like this, and when it gets too hot, take it off and ride like this, which is how I was riding in the desert and etc. So that's a sweatshirt underneath, and if I take this off, this, this is the protection underneath. So this is force field, um, elbow, neck, and back. They have those, that's about 200 pounds to have one of these. You fit and forget. Once you've fitted it, you won't know it's on there. It's the next other layer, and it's the best thing you have. This center pad is quite important because quite a common accident when you're off road is into sand and going over the handlebars. And that sort of protects you as you, where well, you can do that. Hopefully you'll never use any of this kit. Then um, these are Dakar pants and they're called Dakar when you're in Morocco because again, they're vented. I've got strap on knee pads, which I can't really show you because uh, I just find they're always in the right place, but I will show you the boots. And these are former boots and I can wear these. They're like slippers to wear, I find. I can wear those all day long. Um, some people go for motocross boots and they're a bit like ski boots. So you can't wait to get out of them at the end of the day. I find with these, I'm happy and uh, I can wear them around the house. Can't wait to put them on, no issues. And I didn't get wet feet at all, even though with all that water. So there you go. Oh, I'll just show you this um, rucksack. Again, what makes this one? Quadrilock. This, this I find absolute treat because the straps come together and then clip into place like that. And then you've got another one that round, round your waist that comes around too. And again, it's a fit and forget. You don't know you've got this on, but it's really important to have a camelback. So this got camelback and I'll take my passport tickets in the outer one, cameras, all sorts of gear in, the, in there. And that's what I have with me rather than having a, a pannier. So there you go. I hope that gives you an idea how to do it. We, I've gone this time with Desert Rose Racing, Zippy and Patsy Quick. They, they do a lot of training for Paris Dakar and other events. They just know Morocco like the back of their hand. They've guided me round some of the course, the four of us. We paid, I think it was 1,500 pounds each per person to go on this trip. That includes bringing the bikes from the UK, which is a bit of a bargain, I think. And then you've got where flights were, I think we paid just over 500 pounds. You'd probably get it cheaper if you book a long time ahead. Um, hotels, they're not as much. Morocco's pretty cheap to stay in. I haven't seen the final bill, but we've done four days. I think we'll be about five, 600 pounds for that. So two and a half thousand for this amazing time we've had in Morocco. And I hope you've enjoyed coming with us and just seeing some of the sights and the crazy part of Morocco and up hidden areas that gorge, the rain, the sand, etc. We've had, we've had a wonderful adventure. Hope you've enjoyed it too. If you have, keep watching, keep subscribing. More videos coming along very soon.